for Windsor West. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And as this is the first time I've been able to rise for a speech, uh, I do want to thank the residents of Windsor West, and I couldn't think of a more appropriate uh, way to start this engagement. My riding represents 40% of the daily trade that goes to the United States between uh, 30,000 vehicles, 10,000 trucks pre-COVID. It's returning to that level. Um, but as well, Mr. Speaker, um, we date back to the Underground Railroad, uh, where slaves escaped to our community of Windsor across from Detroit. We were there for the War of 1812. We were there for times when Detroit came over to actually um, fight fires in Windsor. And in 9-11, we sent our firefighters to there. And so we are very much ingrained with U.S. culture and the U.S. economy. In fact, around 2,000 healthcare professionals during COVID-19 uh, have gone over daily as essential workers to the United States uh, to serve in their hospitals as doctors, nurses, um, and other healthcare professionals. And the really, at the end of the day, Mr. Speaker, uh, we have a broken relationship uh, with the United States. This is a part of the part of the problems that we're facing with Softwood right now. Uh, ironically, this June will be 20 years ago when I first attended my original lobby as an MP with Pierre Pettigrew, the then Minister of International Trade, down at the Canadian Embassy to lobby against softwood lumber tariffs uh, for this country and this nation. And many times I've been down there as part of the Canada-US Parliamentary Association in a nonpartisan fashion to continue to push the issue. But the reality is, is what we've seen over the last several years is a breaking down of that relationship. And it really is at the feet of this government right now. And it's going to take a conscious effort to actually reverse that course. Um, you look at the situation with, uh, you can call it the USMC, the uh, CAMSA, the new NAFTA, whatever you want it to be. The fact of the matter is that Canada was even out negotiated and outmaneuvered by Mexico uh, by signing that agreement. And when you look at the progressive forces, senators and Congress people who I'm very familiar with the United States, they took note that Canada originally wanted an agreement that did not include the environment, that did not include labor. It was Mexico and the United States that added that component, and later on, Canada had to come back to the table to ratify that change. And Mr. Speaker, I can tell you there's a two-way breakdown here that's taking very succinctly. Uh, a good example, it might be seem like a small one, but Canada is negligent on our Fisheries Commission contribution, which is around seven to nine million dollars to fight lampreys in the Great Lakes, and we refuse to pay the bill. Uh, we have ourselves wanting to build a nuclear waste um, uh, facility off the Great Lakes where the United States didn't do it because Canada asked under Joe Clark not to do that on the American side. We have a series of different issues that have emerged and they are forefront and center when most recently this government went down to the actual United States to push on EV vehicles. In fact, Mr. Speaker, when we signed the original NAFTA, hammered, uh, it hammered communities like myself who actually lost the auto industry to what it used to have because we actually, in our new NAFTA, lost the auto pact, a, tra a favorable trading position that was actually negotiated by previous governments. And when they went down there, Mr. Speaker, they left, and I have never seen anything like that. They left and they came back, and as the member for Timmins James Bay noted, they actually got another repercussion that was not even in the, the rear view mirror from what they could actually see or what they would admit. This is equivalent to rubbing the dog's nose in it. That's what took place. It's very significant and shows the breakdown that we have that has become more significant. But I don't want to, I, you know, I have only a couple minutes left, Mr. Speaker, to stop without saying these tariffs, these tariffs, we have to remember that they are jobs, they are families, they are value-added work that men and women have done. And I know my whip just recently lost an actually another plant in her riding, another mill that was closed. And Mr. Speaker, as New Democrats, we have called for sectorial strategies for auto, for the lumber industry, for oil and gas, a series of different industries so we are not dependent upon rip and ship, Mr. Speaker. And that's the negotiation tactic that we have to push back against Buy America and other protectionist policies that are in the United States. They're part of their culture. But only if we develop our sectorial strategies will it give us weight at the table to push back against this protectionism. Question and commentary. The Honourable Member for Central Okanagan, Samilkameen Nicola. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I certainly want to. Uh, Thank the member uh, for his speech. I would love to ask him about Crown, Crown copyright, but uh, different discussion for another day. Um, but what I'd like to ask this member is, we are seeing where more and more investment is shifting southward. That's bad for workers. 
who want to put their skills to use, that want to put food on the table for their families. It's bad for those communities, specifically for those communities that rely extensively on forestry for that employment. Now, we have seen this government plot along and has not paid attention to this file. In fact, my very first words in the opening of this parliament in 2015 was, will the government put in the mandate letter a specific reference to getting a softwood lumber arrangement? This government continues to just status quo. And it's only when members of parliament, like the member here, uh, and like uh, members from British Columbia that have been asking questions of the government, uh, it seems that this government has no uh, plan to deal with this. So does this member agree that the government needs to start getting serious on this file and actually engage with the Americans? What other things would, does he believe needs to be done to get this job done? Well, member for Windsor West. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and we will follow up on Crown Copyright. And thank you for the question. You know, it's really important. Um, I think this sets an example coming up with regards to our nation in terms of how immature we really still are as a nation. Other countries, including the United States, have sectorial strategies for aerospace. The United States, with their electric vehicles, as a good example, and it's now it's softwood lumber. We saw this coming, quite frankly. And when you see what's happening with regards to mineral deposits in Canada, we right now don't even have a plan on how to actually make this into a robust development strategy for our electric vehicles. And that's why the government got upset in terms of having to scramble the last minute to go down there. We already had a national auto strategy. We used to be number three in the world in manufacturing. We were down now to 10. And so, Mr. Speaker, sectorial strategies where we actually protect workers but also invest in their future like other countries, is how we actually push back and have integrated supply lines that mean something at the negotiation and bargaining table. Question a commentaire, l'honorable député de Shefford. Questions and comments. The honourable member for Shefford. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. We are listening to the speeches. There is a lot of urgency. This matter is urgent. Many regions, many of Quebec's regions, will be affected by this. For example, AVTB or Lac Saint Jean, even in my neck of the woods in Estrie, many people will be affected by these issues with lumber. This industry is very important for all of our regions. The Bloc Québécois has a great plan for secondary and tertiary processing. I've met with a lot of stakeholders recently. I'd like to hear my colleague on the importance of protecting forest producers. The Honourable Member for Windsor West. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, you know, here's where we really can actually take advantage of our current situation. There's no reason why we can't use this in the interim as we go through for a robust housing strategy across this country. There is going to be a supply issue that's going to create a moment where if we actually keep some of these actual facilities in operation as we deal with the unfair trading path, uh, process to actually do some national objectives and national goals. And that's why I think as a unified Canadian uh, component with regards to the industry was so successful in the past on pushing things back, Mr. Speaker. But again, a strategy, a plan with actual guidelines, timetables and follow through with a directive by people. And that's actually how we get something done. And it will actually be respected in the United States. It means something to them when they actually have something in front of them that way. Questions and comments, uh, the Honourable Member for uh, North Island Powell River. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member so much for his very informative speech. I know for myself in my riding today in Powell River, a mill, a paper mill, was permanently curtailed. Uh, those are going to have huge impacts. Hundreds of people are going to be impacted in this area. And one of the most frightening things is we have a federal government that doesn't seem to take these things seriously and doesn't understand the huge impact that these kind of events have on our small rural communities across this country. I'm just wondering if the member could explain to this government the action that needs to happen so that these communities aren't left so far behind. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Windsor West with a very short answer. Thank you, and I thank uh, my colleague for the question. 
And there's no doubt one of the most important things, Mr. Speaker, is to have that type of a long-term commitment for a sectorial strategy because there's no doubt the products that are being produced are worthwhile. They're being affected by other things outside the world. But those workers are worth it. Those communities are worth it. It just can't be go and find another job. We used to have that vision. We need to return to it. That's what other countries are doing. We did a strong before. We can do a strong again. But it takes a commitment and a long-term commitment from the government. That's the protection that we need and the support workers respect in this.